So welcome everybody to this episode of the Sailing Science Center podcast being produced by Charlie Deist. And today's podcast is a conversation between me and Charlie. Charlie's the author of Hormetics. It's a book about how our bodies adapt to small stressors. But overall, the conversation is about health and what it means to be healthy. Uh, Charlie also is a sailor. He's a volunteer for the Sailing Science Center. He's been producing all of our podcasts, and he holds a Coast Guard license, does charters on his own boats. He currently owns an Islander 36. Charlie teaches a an exercise program called MoveNat that's framed around the idea of using natural natural movement to maintain uh, health flexibility and and fitness. So he's got a significant amount of experience in all of these areas. So what is health? Uh, The dictionary doesn't help us very much on that. It basically defines health as the absence of disease. But we can talk about physical health, mental health, cognitive health, financial health, environmental health, what does it mean? And the best definition that I could come up with health is having things properly in balance. Um, We have a proper balance of what's coming in and what's going out, um, consumption and, you know, rejection or elimination of waste and, uh, and so forth. Even when we're looking at financial health, what are we looking at? We're looking at a balance sheet, right? And, and when we're looking at an, an ecological system, we're looking at balance. So with that, I'm going to just do a little, maybe a little Q&A with Charlie, and let's start with, with hormetics. And Charlie, why don't you give your, your definition of hormetics and what that is and why that matters to health? Sure. Well, I like the way that you framed health in the, the affirmative of a uh, a balance of inputs and outputs. Hormetics is an approach to fitness that recognizes that all life evolves within a force field of stressors. Stressors like heat, stressors like cold, uh, prolonged periods when maybe food wasn't available. This is where you get your fasting uh, traditions. Uh, You find the same principle when it comes to resistance training and athletes who go to greater and greater lengths to challenge their bodies stressing them with heavy weights or endurance challenges that lead them to become stronger. That's what hormetics is really about. Revitalizing yourself through the appropriate quantity of stress so that you're not just brutalizing yourself into shape. I believe it was Hippocrates who said the the dose is the poison or the poison. Paracelsus. Oh. I always pictured Paracelsus <laughs> being an, an ancient Greek guy, but it turns out he was a, a European uh, writing, I think, in the 1500s. But that's a a perfect encapsulation of the idea. The dose makes the poison because a lot of things will kill you at too high a dose. Too much stress will kill the organism, but the right amount ends up making it stronger. Not enough stress, and that breeds another kind of ill health. I recently heard a podcast in which Rhonda Patrick was being interviewed by Andrew Huberman that even the idea of having uh, being emotionally healthy actually requires periodically being emotionally stressed. In other words, we, if we go through life on sort of emotional flatline, it does not build emotional resilience that we need to have. We need to have ups and downs. And that I can say from my own experience that having low points, so let's, let's take a broken heart, for example. Okay. And I've probably any of us who've lived for a little while, we've had our heart broken. And boy, the first time it happens, you just think, you know, I'm not getting over this. And that then you realize, you know, 10 years later, you did get over it. And the next time it happens, <laughs> if, you're, if you're so unfortunate, and I think, it, I think it is part of life that, you know, we have our heart broken in many different ways, many different times. And it's not always romantic. It can be other things just that we've set our sights on that we become more resilient to it because we recognize, oh, 
it's another one of these. Right. Emotional hormesis takes some, some tough life lessons to wise us up to the ways of the world. And when it comes to relationships or heartbreak, like you're saying, or, you know, I use the example of um, meditation or prayer. That practice can be hormetic in the, in the sense that it trains our discipline to be comfortable with being maybe a little bit bored. And uh, nowadays we have entertainment at our fingertips whenever we want it. And we rarely have to just be alone with our thoughts. So that's another area where the process of challenging yourself to endure something that's a little bit uncomfortable leads to a sort of mental focus, a crispness. Uh, and so, you know, I think to, to transition this conversation a little bit into uh, the realm of, of sailing, if I can, for a second, I think I really first encountered real world challenges when I plunged headlong into a boat, my first boat ownership project. This was back in 2014. And uh, I just started sailing, but only dinghies mostly and, and a couple friends boats. And uh, I was drawn to this, you know, almost free boat. But you know what they say about you know, no such thing as a free boat. And in this case, it was particularly true. Uh, it was a real project and it involved fiberglass work and wrestling with outboards and, and more than a few times I would nick my finger on something or find myself, you know, grinding fiberglass in an awkward position and kind of thinking to myself, why did I get myself into this? Uh, and I'll never forget the first time that I took the boat out of the marina. It was a particularly windy day out of Berkeley, right there on uh, on the fan, they call it, you know, the where the wind just howls all summer long. And it was probably blowing probably 25 knots that day. And the, the waves were, you know, a good two and a half feet tall. And, uh, and, and I had to go up to the foredeck because we had started to raise the jib before realizing we really weren't quite ready yet. And uh, so I had to run up to, to pull the jib back down and secure it to the deck uh, while my friend steered from behind. He had a little more experience than me. And I, I kind of looked back at him and asked as we're about to leave the marina, you know, should we turn back? And he goes, never forget, he says, probably, <laughs> and just keeps going forward. So there we are, you know, the boat's hammering up and down, and, and I'm there clinging onto the bow pulpit for dear life. Uh, I think I said a, a couple prayers then, and uh, thankfully, you know, I, I was able to tie it down with my makeshift knot and, and get back to the cockpit. But uh, that was one of my first real experiences of like a, a you know, physical challenge. Um, there was some risk involved. I don't think that there was really a huge danger. Um, but that's, I think, an, another important distinction where when we're seeking out new challenges, we want to make sure that they're still within our safe hormetic zone, that we're not going into the realm of danger. Uh, risk can be managed. Danger is something that should be avoided. That's an interesting thought uh, about risk and danger. And, you know, if we're talking just about physical health, that can, um, but there's also mental and emotional health too, right? And, and our own personal growth. And how do we get past that? Uh, sometimes, sometimes we are not going to be willing to put ourselves into the kind of challenges that we really need to have because we're, we might, turns out, be capable of handling a lot more than either what we think we can handle or what we're willing to handle. Um, and, you know, I, I will give my, my own example, which was getting, it's very similar to yours, Charlie, on a bigger scale, you're getting caught in some very bad weather sailing from New Zealand to Tonga and actually not being sure that we were going to get out of it. Um, and, you know, <laughs> There was no, there was no help to be found there. We did, otherwise I wouldn't be here now. And, you know, what I would say might echo yours, you know, your comment a little bit. I would never knowingly put myself or anybody else into that situation. It was extremely difficult. It, it tried our endurance, uh, our ingenuity, our ability to think under pressure. It, but at the same time, it revealed to me things about myself that I would never have known. I would only have been able to guess about. Um, 
in the absence of that kind of challenge. So how I encapsulate it is never want to go there again. It was one of the most valuable experiences of my life. Right. And so, and, and so that becomes a, a problem, right? Because I say, wow, I would like other people to have that level of growth, but I'm not going to prescribe for anybody to go out and put themselves in that kind of danger. Right. Well, I've got a, a business model for you. This is, this is my startup. Tell me if, uh, if you think that it is fundable. Uh, there, I'll first tell an anecdote that's also in the Horm Hormetics book uh, from a uh, Greek Stoic philosopher, Zeno the Stoic, who was also, I think, briefly emperor. And he at one point was shipwrecked and, uh, you know, narrowly survived. And when he got back home, got back to land, he found that, you know, the sheets were a little bit softer, the food tasted better, the sun was a little bit warmer and brighter. So he had that same experience of kind of, you know, appreciation after the near-death experience. And the quote from Zeno the Stoic that sticks in, in my memory is, uh, now that I've been shipwrecked, I'm on a good journey. The next part of this is that Zeno the Stoic then made it uh, an annual tradition to go out and pretend to get shipwrecked and, you know, spend some time in the freezing cold water just to be able to appreciate life again. So it's a very Stoic uh, idea. And I don't know if I would take it that far, but, you know, maybe I could take people out in the bay and, uh, put, you know, push them out with a life jacket on and then throw them the ring after after they've been shivering for a little while. What do you think? Can I well, can I make money the, off this? You know, yeah, you can. Um, but, I, I, you know, I don't know if that's the way. But, um, you know, as you were describing that, I thought, oh, this is a metaphor for intermittent fasting. That, <laughs> uh and maybe we'll talk about intermittent fasting a little bit and let you talk about, you know, the benefits of that, maybe about autophagy and some other things. But, you know, I do this now. Typically, I uh, one day a week, I don't eat. I fast. And uh, what I can tell you for certain is that the, the following day when I do eat, the food tastes better. Um, and it's not that I'm, uh, it's not that I'm starving, but all of my senses are more acute, um, which is which is a surprising thing. Most people don't realize that when you fast, it does heighten these senses. I mean, people people who haven't fasted won't won't expect this, but if you have fasted, then it's like, yeah, that's exactly what happens, and it heightens everything. It makes everything better. So, um, Charlie, maybe because you've delved into this a little bit yourself can talk about intermittent fasting. And by the way, I, I, this is probably a good time to say that uh, Char neither Charlie nor I, we're not we're medical, not medical experts. experts. Not be offering... We're not here to prescribe or uh, tell you how to deal with any medical conditions. Um, please consult your doctor before, you know, taking any action to, to resolve any, uh, any situations or conditions that you have. So, with that disclaimer. Yeah, well, you beat me to it. I was going to say the same thing. You know, I'm no expert. Uh, and fasting might not be for everybody. And everyone should be careful and kind of test their own limits before going overboard. And there are actually alternative ways to reap some of the benefits of fasting without going all the way in the extreme of, uh, you know, just a water fast where you're only drinking water. Uh, you can do things like supplement with electrolytes, or you can even eat kind of a high fat ketogenic diet a few days in a row to get into ketosis, which will uh, have some of the same benefits of fasting. Uh, but that word you mentioned autophagy, which just means self eating is a process that takes place in your cells, where they start to recycle the junk organelles that uh, have kind of died or broken down. Uh, but they're still floating around in the in the cell plasma. And so um, this, you know, biology, again, in its wisdom, devised a mechanism to utilize the stress of a period without food to go into the cell and clean itself up. So that's where autophagy comes from. And uh, in particular, if you're eating a diet that is very low in protein for a period of time, I mean, like very low, like less than five grams per day, which is which is not much at all. Uh, I think the recommendation is to eat something like 
a gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. So you're imagining, you know, a 20 to 30 time factor reduction. Um, that can also imitate some of the benefits of autophagy. But uh, I do think, you know, if you're if you're able and if your doctor gives you the go ahead or if you feel like you're uh, capable of testing this out yourself, you know, there's um, there are benefits, clarity, focus uh, that come from from not eating. We know is that actually most Americans, it's well over 50 percent, have some level of metabolic dysfunction. Um, so this is this is rampant right now. And that, you know, trying to improve our metabolism, most of this has to do with the, the mitochondria, the little energy powerhouses in our cells and keeping those healthy. Um, and that's become a whole topic of its, of its own. But this, this idea of, again, you know, creating these stressors, and in this case, it's the, it's the fasting, but it's also the idea that your body is able to do really one thing at a time. It's either building or it's cleaning up. Um, and if, if we're constantly eating, we never give our bodies a chance to clean up at the cellular level. And so you accumulate all these toxins and junk um, at the cellular level. And I think that's a lot of what, what's creating ill health, um, you know, in, in our modern society. So what do you see as, you know, in a societal way as the biggest challenges we have with having a healthy society with people getting healthy because we're having we're really in a a national health crisis right now and the the interventions that we've tried so far haven't seemed to work do you have any thoughts on that on you know what people can do that you know could at least on an individual level address that yeah, it's a huge question, and there's so many angles that you can approach it from. There is the what I call food milieu, which is sort of you know the the generic food supply, what you see when you go to the grocery store, and people talk about the center aisles with processed foods. But ultimately, that's a product of consumer demand and the fact that people, by and large, uh, want what's quick and easy. And our, our primate brains are maybe even even more primitive than that. Our our, our sort of reptile brains uh, crave the you know the combinations of foods that would have been advantageous in a in a scarce evolutionary environment. Um, that tends to be the sort of salty, sweet, fat, fatty combination that uh, we're wired to to find just delicious and, and rewarding. So there's sort of the food reward hypothesis for why we're overconsuming, in particular these uh, foods that are not particularly nutritious. And for that, the answer is just to to eat more nutrient dense food uh, that fills you up. E eating more foods that contain the you know the healthy fats. Um, and again, not to get too deep into the weeds on sort of macronutrients because there's a wide variety of macronutrient ratios that can be healthy. And if you're eating uh, nutrient dense foods, it, it doesn't matter quite so much where they're coming from, whether it's mostly plants, mostly animals. You know, I know a lot of healthy vegetarians. Um, I, I do believe that uh, the, the demonization of uh, saturated fats and animal products, meat, is uh, is sort of a misstep in this, uh, you know, in what the establishment has been telling us over the last fifty years. So I think combating some of the misinformation that says, you know, uh, meat is bad for you. Well, it depends. How is the animal raised? Uh, you know, is this, uh, and, and you know, what are you eating it in combination with? Uh, a cheeseburger from Wendy's with a milkshake. And a box of fries, yeah, that's going to rocket your insulin and it's going to send all those fat calories from the, the, the hamburger patty and the cheese straight into your cells. But if you're eating, uh, you know, a, a, a really well-raised grass-fed uh, hamburger patty that's, um, that's, that's not consumed along with some of these other 
agents of inflammation or things that spike your insulin, then that will be a, you know, something that's filling. It's very nutrient dense. If you take the nutrient profile of, uh, of something like ground beef and stack it up against kale, uh, you get way more nutrition actually from, from the ground beef. Not saying that kale is bad for you. Kale also has a lot of nutritious benefits. Um, and, and another rabbit hole we could go down is the whole uh, plant uh, phytochemical hormetic pathway. And, and this is a theory that basically says the main benefits from eating more vegetables don't necessarily come from the nutrients, but actually from certain things that at, at too high a dose would be an anti-nutrient. Uh, things like, uh, in, in uh, I forget the, I think sulfuric acid and or sulfuric, uh, sulforaphane in broccoli is something that, um, that can be toxic at too high of levels, but at lower levels has these hormetic benefits. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the food compartment, uh, on the exercise, uh, pillar, there is the trend towards sedentary life. We have lots of technologies that enable us not to do the kinds of work that would have been necessary for survival, whether that was hunter gatherers in prehistoric times, or just the, the sort of run of the mill manual labor that was required to grow and cultivate and process food. Now it's all processed for us in factories. So the advent of, you know, petroleum and internal combustion engines, this takes away a lot of the movement requirements and we have to find ways to start moving again in ways that uh, don't feel, in my opinion, that don't feel artificial. So, you know, for some people, they've got their gym routine, it works for them, that's great. But other people find that to be really painful and boring. And uh, I'm one of those, actually. Uh, I can't just go to the gym and run on a treadmill for an hour. That, you know, makes me want to, uh, it feels like work. <laughs> Whereas if I go out sailing or if I go and do natural movement in the park with a group of friends, we can all sort of feed off of each other's energy. We might play some games. Uh, you know, sports would also fall under this category, but uh, the culture in the United States, at least for the past, again, 50, 60 years has been towards um, more spectatorship rather than participation. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few things that, that I would point to, you know, just from a nutrition and movement point of view, we've lost touch with some of these older traditions or even requirements uh, that that led us to greater health. Um, but there's many others. There's you know there's the the general addiction to comfort. I'm curious to know actually what what you think, what you see as maybe even deeper root causes than the ones that I'm pointing out. Well, see, yeah, it's it's an interesting question and. The, I, I think that it is that we've gotten too comfortable um, because, because we can, right? And that, boy, I, I crave those sweets, I mean, as much as anybody. And I, I, I have, I'm, I'm far from having perfect willpower on this stuff. If you put them in front of me, I eat them. And the best, you know, my best solution is to stay away from them. Um, that, you know, as far as exercise is concerned, that's a challenge as well. Uh, fortunately, I've stayed in fairly good shape and I've had good role models. Um, you know, in particular, my mother's been a exerciser as long as I've been alive. Um, and I, but I still have to uh, sometimes trick myself. And um, I, I love the nod there that, you know, even, even this morning, so I, I do an alternating pattern where uh, one day I will do, uh, I'll, I'll always go for a walk in the morning, uh, you know, just to get my, my heart rate going first thing out of bed. And then I, I come back and I'll either do some uh, resistance training, so I have some weights that I lift, or I'll do yoga. And I'll, I'll trick myself. I'll say, well, I'm just going to do the push-ups because I don't feel like doing the whole thing today. And as soon as I start doing that, then it actually, I've done the routine so many times that without even thinking, I go into the next, you know, the next set of, of whatever it is. This morning I was doing yoga and I, I didn't really feel like doing it. And I said, it's like, I'll do it later in the day, but I'll, I'll tell you what. And I'm, this is like the conversation that I'm having with myself. Right. And I say, I'll tell you what, I'll just do the forward bend, you know, and I do the forward bend. And the next thing I'm no, 
you know, the next thing you know, I've done the whole, the whole routine. And it's like, you know, right. you get three quarters of the way. It's like, I'll just floss one yeah, tooth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just floss one tooth, you know, just try it. And, um, you know, so those are, those are some effective games. And they actually work that once you've, once you've developed the routine, um, you can, you know, manipulate your own psychology. So that helps. And, and also the, you know, there's certain rewards um, that, you know, I certainly appreciate that at 64 years of age, um, you know, when I'm getting ready to shower, I look in the mirror and I go, Hey, you look okay for a 64 year old guy, you know, probably look better than the average 30 year old. Um, and, and so there's a nice, there's a nice reward for that. Um, but it, it is hard. And I, I think that, you know, so it's become an identity for you that helps to motivate some of the virtuous, uh, habits. You know, it's it. That's exactly right, Charlie. It's exactly right. I remember in the 1980s. It was about 1980. Um, I was talking to someone who was a little bit. It was a woman. She was older than me. She was probably in, in her 40s, and she was telling me. And I, you know, at that time, I was in my 20s, and she was telling me how, yeah, it, it gets harder. You know. In, in your third decade, it's much harder in your fourth decade, you know, forget it. And I remember that actually that conversation was there. That was a decision point for me because I said to myself at that time, I'm never going to let that happen. Right. And, and it stuck with me. And it's funny how those things do stick with us that we say it, it does become an identity thing. And so I, you know, if you've if you've got an identity that you've had for decades, then changing that is, of course, it's more difficult than if you adopt an identity earlier on. Right. Yeah, I got this concept from uh, I think it was a Cliff Notes version of the best-selling Atomic Habits book that everyone seems to be talking about these days. James Clear, who uh, since I didn't actually read his book, I'll, I'll plug his newsletter. He he has uh you know one of the, one of the best newsletters out there where he just distills kind of all the, the the wisdom that he's been reading on the internet into into just a couple bullet points that you can read in in five minutes while you drink your coffee. He talks about how forming habits uh, really has to stem from uh, a change in your identity and uh, and that you will not do the things long term at least that are incompatible with your identity. So maybe we've been approaching the problem of willpower all wrong, where we try to white knuckle our way to weight loss or our, our fitness goals, whereas we should really be focusing on, you know, how do we reshape our identity? Is it, you know, telling yourself affirmations in front of the mirror or is it, uh, is it something that, that comes externally from other people in our life? Uh, so that sort of shifts us into the, the cultural question beyond what we can do individually to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, uh, you know, where are the, where are the cultural icons like the Jack LaLanne's or even the, you know, John F. Kennedy's who are challenging the, the nation or challenging the culture to put this front and center as part of their identity. So I've been inspired by, by JFK in particular, uh, in, in what his message to Americans was upon taking office in 1961 and that was that as a nation, we're becoming softer, that we uh, don't embrace the challenges in the same way that our, our ancestors did, and that no civilization can be really successful long term without some sort of a robust physical culture. The Greeks knew this. They combined gymnastics and, uh, and, and you know, outdoor workouts with mathematics and ethics. So... They understood that, you know, a well-rounded education meant mens sana in corpore sano, which is a healthy mind in a healthy body. And uh, so his presidential fitness challenge was part of trying to revive the great classical physical culture of ancient Greece in order that America might open up a new frontier. So his new frontier agenda was much bigger than just looking good in the mirror, which is a good motivation, but there might be an even better one. It, it is a good motivation. And I think, you know, this at this point, I, there's something I wanted to 
put in, which was in your your discussion about health, um, you you've talked about exercise, the importance of exercise and and nutrition or diet. And really I think that there there are three major pillars of of health, just like there are three major macronutrients, you know, in our nutrition, which are exercise, diet, and and sleep. And if I can tie all of these things together uh, with James Clear's book, which by the way, I'll I'll give a plug for it. I read the whole book and it was extraordinary. It was it's a very, very good book. There's a reason why it's on the bestsellers list. I think Hormetics is going to be there soon, but <laughs> um, and people people will say, well, this was the seminal work. He wasn't well recognized for it, but <laughs> um, that what I did not understand before reading uh, Clear's book was that this idea of willpower is a limited resource and that it's actually strongest at the beginning of the day. Oh, that's interesting. What is this willpower? Willpower actually is, it involves our cognition, it, it, you know, our forebrain and the, the energy in our brain. And as we fatigue, and boy, I'll tell you what, I have, I, since learning this, I have seen this in myself over and over again, that when I am fatigued, when I'm tired, my willpower is just out the door. But at the beginning of the day, if I've had a good night's sleep, I've got great willpower. And so what I've learned is to leverage that because then that creates this, this cascade, this positive feedback loop, this virtuous cycle, right? That you say, okay, to get a good night's sleep, you need to eat well and you need to exercise. Right, it's all tied together. So I start with the sleep, and I say, prioritize sleep. What does that mean? It means get to bed on time. It's that simple. Everybody sets an alarm to wake up. I set an alarm to go to bed. It's like don't stay up late because that's where the problem starts. And get to bed on time. Get together. Get to bed on at the same time. Then I've got that that willpower to roll right into my morning exercise routine. And it turns out that statistically people who exercise first thing in the day are three times more likely to actually accomplish their, their exercise objectives than people who exercise in the afternoon. Because by the afternoon you're fatigued, you're, you know, you're, you're done with your day and you go, I'll go to the gym tomorrow. Right, so you get that done first, and and then that again cascades into everything else because you're feeling good, you're hungry, you want to eat a nutritious meal, you know, you you've exercised, it helps your sleep, and everything helps to flow from that. So, I find that you know personally has been a a really good starting point for developing these healthy habits. Yeah, I'm glad that I have found a kindred spirit in you because we've had these conversations over coffee where we talk about the importance of routines and morning routines, and it's almost become a cliche. It's like the clickbait. Mm. You know, here's what the the millionaires and billionaire founders do as for their morning routine, and and I think we we confided that you know we both. Uh, we have to click on that. We have to see, right. even though I think everyone's a little bit different, but there are some commonalities and you point out the cascading effects. And and so getting that morning routine dialed in can have a huge return compared with some of these other forms of, of uh, you know, motivation that we might be looking to to grab onto. Uh, and, and I've found just in the past couple of weeks, I've started going to a, an early morning Muay Thai mm. class. And, uh, I, I, those days when I, when I get up and start my day that way, everything else just kind of seems to fall into place. It gives me that energy to tackle the most important projects of the day. And when I get those things done early, that gives me a little bit of momentum to say, you know, the rest of my to-do list isn't looking so hard. I could probably knock this and this off. Uh, right. Again, you're talking about the, like the nutrition, you want to refuel your body with the right kind of stuff. So you get on the right track there. 
And then at the end of the day, if you've been busy and if you've been productive and if you've been active, then it is much easier to fall asleep. So you, you can continue that virtuous cycle. So finding other kinds of cascading effects, I think, is, is one of the highest priorities if you're looking to increase your overall performance. And, uh, and, and that's another thing that I think draws me to the sailing science mission is this shared sense of wanting to tap into the, the almost unlimited untapped potential that we all have in us. And whatever level we get to, there's always another layer to peel back. There's always another, uh, there's always another d degree of, of, uh, capability that we can develop if we surround ourselves with the right people, the right environment to unlock that potential. Yeah. And you, um, this, this diverges from the health conversation, but you, you know, you just touched on something that's actually pretty important, which is that idea of there always being another level. And, and really of this, I mean, it sounds a little corny, but really of it being a journey, not a destination. And, uh, you know, that's, it's sort of overused, but in contemplating, do, you know, going forward with the Sailing Science Center, because I had to do a little soul searching before I said, okay, I'm going to jump in with, with both feet. And then you get, get to a point of no return um, where you say, okay, I'm committed to this thing now. And I asked myself, um, okay, you know, the, the statistics say like most of these kinds of uh, pursuits fail. Okay. And so statistically, the odds, the odds are against us. Of course, you know, in my heart, I, and, and we always have this, this bias that, um, you know, that we, we think we're going to beat the statistics. And so, so what if, what if it does fail? It's like, okay, well, wait a minute, because even, even if the, the goal that's set is not accomplished, it's really about the growth path along the along the way and and learning and developing and you know even you know up to this point ha becoming you know a bigger contributor in the community and affecting change so there is no failure <laughs> and and no matter what happens it's a success and so when you see that when you see it that way that the whole idea is to, to go out and have these experiences and to grow and develop. I think we want to embrace that and we want to, you know, we w want to do that in the best way that we can and uh, find ways that we can, you know, navigate life and have the biggest positive influence that we can have. Indeed. Yeah. And, and there are, there are cascading benefits, I think, that kick in when you take that step. When you put yourself out there, I think the universe has a way without getting too woo woo, uh, you know, of of kind of rewarding risk. Uh, it's not always the case; otherwise, it it wouldn't be considered risky. But uh, I do think that you know, for me, again, going back to my sailing journey, um, even though that first boat that I got it was a complete rip off, even though it was practically free, uh, that still set me on the path. And what feels like a um, sort of a, you know, an, an obstacle or a misstep in the short term, I look back on that as a, a very cheap education in all mm. kinds of things that have served me well in the boats that I've owned since then. And, uh, and, and just the, the practice and the discipline of kind of solving real world physical problems um, for me has been a very healthy thing. It's been a very motivating thing. And I think that motivation in one area carries over into the other areas of our life and doing hard things hones us iron sharpens iron you know we we need challenges in order to rise to the occasion and in doing so we find that we build up a reservoir of strength that we never knew that we had so that's going to be true of fasting that's going to be true of jumping in the cold water experiencing a shipwreck you know there's the emotional hardness as well but, you know, in it, at the thing that you said was do hard things. I think this is a, you know, a good direction to flow with it. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the uniqueness of sailing and in particular with the, the uniqueness of sailing and 
All right. Um, I'll bite. That's, uh, that's another big topic. I, uh, I come to the practice of natural movement through a French naval officer named Georges Hebert. And Hebert was famous in his own time in uh, sort of, you know, early 20th century France as the, the popularizer of this concept of la méthode naturelle, which is translated into the natural method um, and also the move nat, natural movement school of thought that I subscribe to. But it really does have its roots in sailing because Hebert was, uh, you know, up and coming in the Navy as a, as a young uh, sailor in the, the last days of the age of sail before they transitioned to steamships and internal combustion engines. And he was actually stationed on one of these tall ships off the coast of the volcanic island of Martinique when the volcano exploded, covering the whole island in a layer of molten ash. And observing this from the, the, sh the, the boat, uh, the sailors went ashore in the rowboats and for the next several days were pulling people out of this ash. Mm -hmm. And Hebert's reflection on this was that only the people who were strong were useful. So that applied to both the population of Martinique and also to the, the, the crew on the boat. But you can bet that most of those sailors were in pretty good shape because they spent their time, you know, hoisting sails and climbing the rig. Uh, the top mast men or, or gabirs were, uh, you know, some of the, the most nimble. And if you think about what it takes to pull your own body weight up, that's about the best overall test of, of, of all purpose strength that there is. Uh, so these guys were, were in, in peak shape. But outside of uh, this world, when he came back to France, he was observing the same thing that, that Kennedy saw, which was sort of the softening of the population. And he thought that the answer lay in going back to the sort of prehistoric patterns, what you might call primitive patterns, but, but really some of them are very advanced techniques for moving efficiently in uh, utilitarian ways. And uh, so Hebert's motto was be strong to be useful. You don't have to be rescuing people out of the volcanic ash to help your fellow man, uh, to be more useful around the house. And, um, and, and I think when it comes to sailing as a sport, uh, it, it's not strictly utilitarian, but I, I do think that there is, you know, to the extent that there is a, a social value to sailing, this is an area where we can practice embodiment and, uh, and and kind of breaking out of the the paradigm of exercise as a chore, as the you know the fitness industrial complex, you got to go to the gym and sweat it out. You can get out in the elements, uh, exposing yourself to a wide variety of hormetic stressors, from the cold air on your face to you know the sun and the 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 waves that come and splash you, to just the the feeling of instability in this fluid medium where you have to move around the boat, which itself is moving around in the water. Uh, all these things require a, a sense of proprioception and uh, a degree of movement competence that Hebert thought needed to be incorporated into the training, not just for sailors and, and naval recruits, but that would be a model for basically physical education for the, the entire country. So he designed these... Uh, facilities they were they tended to be just wide open spaces fields where you had a couple of obstacles uh things like a climbing wall or a climbing rope um structures that you would climb up to to experience a little bit of vertigo um but but he grouped movement into these 10 basic families mm -hmm. which are walking running climbing crawling uh balance throwing uh fighting or or sort of self defense swimming and i'm probably missing one or two in there throwing i think is one jumping uh but but basically the full spectrum of of natural human movements and going through that list with the exception of self-defense unless you encounter some pirates uh, i think all of them come in handy when you're sailing you know whether it's heaving a, a, a line from the boat to shore or you know climbing the mast when you've got to retrieve a halyard Running also not 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 sure where that factors into sailing, but uh, but but I found that that this school of movement has been very helpful for for my journey as a um, you know becoming a captain and doing charters. Uh, if it weren't for that foundation and that training, I don't think I would really be able to do what I do with with any degree of confidence. Yeah, I think uh, boy, you hit on some really important points there, Charlie. 
um, and I'm going to see if I can encapsulate it as best I can because things that I heard, um, certainly there's the movement and exercise part, but you also mentioned being outside and connected with nature, which is also very important for our, you know, our mental and emotional health. And now we know, you know, being in sunlight, of course, this isn't anything new. We've known this for a long time, that sunlight is extremely important, not only for the production of vitamin D, but also for um, for our emotional health and, um, our, and our mood. And I, I certainly know that myself. And then also the, the social aspect of it, that we're, we're in contact with, typically when we're sailing, we're just sailing with other people. It doesn't have to be, we can be single handers, but, uh, there's, there's the social and, and teamwork aspect of it. And as you were talking about it, I was imagining being on a sailboat, racing, going around a mark and, you know, you've just tacked and you're trimming in the jib and you're on the grinder and you're, you're, you know, just digging into this thing. And you've got this, you know, going into a little bit of the neurochemistry of it, you've, you've got this near-term goal of getting that jib trimmed in. And what's driving you is actually it's dopamine. And we, what we know now is that, you know, dopamine as a neurochemical is more about seeking than it is about getting that yeah there's a little ping that you get when you achieve the goal but it's more about driving you towards the goal so you're actually building up your your dopamine you're building up your you know your serotonin by the you know and oxytocin you know by bonding with the other people in the the cruise and for people who aren't into you know neurochemistry these are all important neurochemicals that you know auger toward toward the health of our of our brains when, when we can, you know, produce these things. So, um, there, there are certainly are a lot of elements and I can't really think of other activities that incorporate all of those things. Um, you know, there are other sports there and there are other team sports. Um, and then, you know, also on boats, there is a, a balance element that is different from being on land because you're, you're, stabilizing yourself on a on a moving platform and i'll i will give as an example um when my at the time my wife and i eleanor we were um just sailing from san francisco to to mexico cabo san lucas and it which is not a particularly long ways i think I think it's about 2,000 miles, maybe a little less than 2,000 total miles. And, you know, with stops along the way. So was, this was not super rigorous or anything. But we get to Mexico and we're like, dude, where'd these muscles come from? <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and, and, and we lost weight and we became more fit in a very short period of time because we were outside, we were you know, burning a lot more calories than we realized just because we were on a moving boat and then periodically, you know, going into these um, high intensity uh, exercises of trimming sails and, you know, very quickly got in very good shape. And, and you know, we, we were astonished by it, quite honestly. Uh, and of course, that continued as long as we were out cruising. Um, but you know, also to to this point that it's it's tragic that a lot of uh, a lot of couples who dream of going cruising uh, that they wait until uh, until retirement or later years in their lives when they actually don't have the fitness to to accomplish what they want to do, um, and and then you know. Unfortunately, those things that they, you know, for 40 years were dreaming of doing, they find that they're, they're not able to do them and there's not a second chance. Right. Well, you're making me want to go cruising, Jim, is it? <laughs> you know, I think that your perception about the, the health benefits of sailing, and I know that you've, I'll use the word extolled, the, uh, the value of sailing as you know, something that has directed you toward better health and fitness and strength. Um, I think it's spot on. 
I think that's right. And it's one of the, one of the reasons that promoting, I think promoting sailing is something worthwhile for us to do. Well, Charlie, this might be a good time for us to, uh, to bring this to a close. Um, any final comments or thoughts that you have on, um, on health and the, maybe the connections to sailing kind of your, you know, on your own journey of this, uh, of this endeavor. Yeah. One, one final thought, uh, this relates to something I've noticed walking around and just looking at people. Oftentimes they're looking at their phone head down and, and, uh, there's even a name for the postural defects that result from this. It's called text neck. And uh, I think we get kind of a tunnel vision from the, the modern addiction to screens and the, the necessity for, for most people's work or, or students for, for school of using a computer for most of the day. And the, the statistics on how much time people are spending in front of screens is, is pretty mind boggling. And so for me, uh, sailing has been the best opportunity to get out in reality. It's kind of an excuse to, to be living in reality and to be 100% aware of my surroundings. And I think that's a affected sort of superficially um, my posture, but that has also been, uh, you know, the external posture is mirrored in a, a kind of internal disposition. And it's another one of these feedback loops where uh, when you're on a sailboat, if you're, if you're at the helm or, or in any position that requires you to be uh, attentive to say the direction of the wind or uh, things like that, that that stance of ready engagement with the world um, translates into other areas, and I think we need more of that. We need we need more people who are truly aware of their surroundings, uh, who are just paying attention, and uh, and that's another critical component of health. Because if you're not paying attention, life's going to pass you by. You're going to get in more accidents. Just be in that in that passive consumer mode as opposed to a mode of ready engagement. Yeah, interesting, and it's sort of a uh, a numbness, right? That um, indeed, but the, you reminded me also of uh, as a coach in the adult sailing program on Treasure Island. I used to tell people, you know, and these are usually young adults in their in their twenties, and I would say, at the end of the day, like, how much of the day did you spend thinking about work? And it was like zero, right? That once, and, and talking about attention and focus, once you get on the water in your sailing, actually, you know, partly by necessity, it takes your full attention. Well, that's a very healthy thing, actually, because it then, you know, put that other hamster wheel of whatever it was that you were worrying about into the background for that period of time, gets it out of your forebrain. Um, and this is extremely good for our mental health. Um, cause usually there's a lot of, you know, kind of <laughs> what Daniel Amen calls automatic negative thinking, right. Or automatic negative thoughts, the ants, uh, and you want to kill those mm. ants, um, and it gets those out. So uh, that might be a final note on, you know, the, the mental health benefit of, of sailing as an activity. One, you know, one final thought on that. Indeed. Kill the ants. Kill the ants. <laughs> So, um, well, this has been extremely enjoyable, Charlie, and I want to thank you for both for your time and for your expertise in producing the podcast um, and just, you know, show my appreciation for your role as a, a volunteer um, for the Sailing Science Center and as a, a like-minded individual who I think, you know, together... Uh, maybe we can help to get this message out to a, a few people and, and maybe a few people will, will hear it and uh, chase down some of these ideas. I certainly hope so. So with that, we'll, we'll conclude this episode of the Sailing Science Center podcast and wish everybody a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.